We're in the book of John, chapter 3 right now in our typical sermon series. We've been walking through John for a while now and been in chapter 3 for a handful of weeks. Typically, on a special Sunday like this one, an Easter Sunday, where the world around us is especially pointing to and celebrating a significant Christian event, Christmas or Easter, and namely, that's what I'm talking about, we pause and we make sure that the sermon, the whole Sunday time, gets to be devoted to that particular event so that we don't miss it. We don't want the, in other words, we never want the world to be celebrating the birth of Jesus and us not do it if we can on any given Sunday. If it happens to be Christmas Sunday, we can do that. We don't want the world to be celebrating Easter and us to miss that special opportunity to give attention to the cross and the empty tomb. Well, this morning, I'm not, I'm not having to make a shift from our typical walk through John in order to pause for a special sermon, because the text of John chapter 3 happens to bring us to a perfect passage to celebrate on Easter. We're in John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 and 15 today. So go ahead and open your Bibles if you have them with you and go there. I, I think providentially, Uh, the Lord has brought us to this uh, exact passage on this day. It's a really, really great one for what we're going to cover. He has been, Jesus has been talking with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a notable, famous Pharisee. He's well known in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem at the very least. History tells us he may have been one of the most wealthy men in all of uh, Jerusalem at this time. He's uh, well known and respected. He's an older man, it sounds like the text is telling us. And uh, we even know that he's called the teacher of Israel. It's a pretty significant title. And yet he comes in the nighttime to speak with Jesus. And I've said before, as we walk through this, I think that he's conveying at least a little bit of a soft heart. It sounds like he actually wants to know some things from Jesus. He's trying to learn from him. Praise God for that. But the conversation that he has with Jesus has been recorded for us and is one of the most famous ones in the Bible because of the truth that Jesus conveys in such a clear and concise way. I want to read through the text we're going to cover today. That's going to be, uh, we're going to cover 14 and 15. I'm just going to back up a little bit for context sake and read 9 through 15. And Jesus is going to reference an Old Testament story. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament and unpack that story before we move back into John 3 to wrap up with some observation and application. So if you have your Bibles, John 3, I'll read 9 to 15 right now. Uh, Follow along, please, if you can. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you did not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this text this morning. Thank you for what it means. I pray that we could be well served by what we read here this morning, be reminded by the death of Christ on our cross for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. Lord, he is the first fruits, the firstborn of the resurrection, that we may follow in his footsteps, that we too may receive a resurrected body and live forever with you in peace and holiness and righteousness and joy not because of anything we have done, but because of what you have provided in your Son. Let us reflect upon these things with sobriety, but with joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Taking a look at the text here, Jesus says this in verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, as we said, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He knows the Old Testament quite well. For Jesus to point to an Old Testament story as he does, it would seem likely that he expects Nicodemus to know this story. So Jesus doesn't unpack it. He simply makes a statement, connects it to himself in his life as the Son of Man, and then moves on. But just to make sure that we are as spun up as Nicodemus presumably would be, let's go ahead and look back 
at that story in Numbers chapter 21 in the Old Testament, the story of the serpent being lifted up. Numbers 21. We're going to be in verses 4 through 9. Uh, we're not going to spend all of our time here today, but I'm just going to look at this story with you and make a few observations. First, you should know the context of Numbers 21. This takes place during the period of history where the Israelites had just been redeemed, delivered out of Egypt. They had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years under the, uh, under the direction of Pharaoh. Uh, things got progressively worse for them. More and more oppression, more and more death. It got really bad. They cried out to God and he sent them a deliverer, the man Moses. He brings them out into the wilderness and pretty quickly the people realize what you and I would realize if we wandered out into the wilderness right now. It wouldn't take very long before we'd be pretty hungry and pretty thirsty. We need something. You're out in the middle of the desert. So what does God do? He provides. First, He provides for their thirst. He gives them water. And not just once, but continually in their wilderness wanderings, God provides water for them. He doesn't only bring them to already existing springs and brooks and rivers and lakes. He brings them to vast wildernesses and then provides water there. On occasion, he even does so by having Moses strike a rock and water flows from the rock. I mean, literally, the driest hard substance, this giant rock, water will spring forth. It's fascinating to think how he provided for the people. And of course, they got hungry. And he provides for them a miraculous way to feed. He provides for them a substance called manna. And it shows up on the ground kind of like dew. I don't think it's, it's, it's like dew or feels like dew, but the way that when you wake up in the morning, the grass is wet, the ground is wet because of dew, like that, each morning the people woke up, Monday or Sunday through Friday, six days in a week, God provided manna for them to go out and collect the sweet coriander seed kind of something. We don't know what it is. The word manna in Hebrew literally means, what is it? Because we don't know. It was only existing for that period of time, and it stopped the day after the people walked out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Forty years of having manna. All this stuff is going to be important here in a moment. Moses had been leading the people all the way through their wilderness wanderings. And the reason they were wandering is because after a short two years of being in the wilderness, God brings them to the promised land. They send in spies, and if you're familiar with the story, you'll know 12 spies go in, and 10 of them, or all of them say, hey, it's beautiful land. It really is. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. This is gorgeous. The grapes, size of your fist. I mean, this is, this is a wonderful place, but someone else has beat us to it. The whole place is filled with cities and, and, uh, and fortresses and giants. I mean, people who will wipe us off the planet if we try to go in. And so even though God had been providing for them day in and day out, the people rejected God. They disbelieved in Him, and their cowardice shone out. And so God judged them and punished them for this folly. He sent them back into the wilderness and said, you know what, you're not going to inherit the promised land. Your kids will. So for 40 years they wander. Towards the end of this time, that we get to our passage in Numbers 21. Moses had one chapter earlier disqualified himself from entering the promised land because he struck a rock twice instead of speaking to it the way that God had commanded to him to provide water. Aaron, the high priest, Moses' brother's brother, just died and then passed off uh, his high priest uh, robes to his son Eleazar. And here, Numbers 21, is where we find ourselves. From Mount Hor... They set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So again, the people are in the wilderness, and this is what happens. They find themselves grumbling or complaining against God. And what's the first error we see here in this passage? It says, and the people became impatient on the way. 
So what were they, what were they impatient for? Well, they were impatient to finally get into the promised land. It had been 40 years. They were just at the tail end of that. They were getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And they're chomping at the bit to get on in. In fact, a few verses before this, the beginning of chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, tell us that there was a Canaanite king who knows of uh, Israel outside the promised land. He goes to attack him, King Arad. And, and God brings a mighty victory against King Arad, delivers his people, wipes out this Canaanite king. And so they've got Canaanite blood on their swords, and they're thinking, we, we want in there. Now let's let us in. Let's do this already. And they, they couldn't just hold it together a little bit longer. Verse 6 says, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of Israel died. These people grumble against God and their impatience, and God sends judgment. And the judgment he sends is in the form of fiery serpents. Now that word really, literally means fiery, like the fiery furnace. It's the same fiery. It's in flames. And uh, a lot of commentators in history have thought maybe the word fiery is used uh, in, in, in multiple ways. Uh, one, because it kind of speaks of God's judgment, flames and fire of judgment that we see a lot of times as an image in the Bible. But additionally, we think that it's a reference to the fact that they were venomous snakes. If you've ever been bitten by a, a non-venomous snake, it doesn't hurt you. You, you. you can be just fine for that. You might have a little bite mark and you'll go on about your day. But these venomous snakes are probably called fiery due to the burning sensation caused by venom. That's typical of venomous snakes. But their bite was lethal. Lethal. Many people even died from the bites from these snakes. Now I want you to imagine for a second, Israel at this time is well over a million people in its population. A million people. It's probably close to the population of Salt Lake County. Salt Lake County is what, about 1.3 million right now? The people of Israel may have numbered about that number. Now if 100 people in the county had been bitten by venomous snakes, that'd be pretty significant, wouldn't it? But a thousand... 10,000 more. For this to be something that the people realized right off the bat, this wasn't just a bad case of, whoop, we, we wandered into a snake den. They knew that this was judgment from God. It had to have been pretty widespread. And while we don't know exactly how many people died, we don't know how many people were bitten, it was pretty exhaustive. I think that the number was quite high for this to be as meaningful as the people uh, seem to make it. Now, you might be thinking, like I do, this is, this is how I tend to think about things. You, have you heard, I'll say to ladies, have you heard men are kind of like problem solvers? We hear a problem, we try to solve it. If someone were to say, so this whole encampment of people find themselves surrounded by snakes, what do you do? Move. Move. You can, trust me, you can outwalk a snake. Just get up and go. Somehow, you must have planted yourselves down on top of a communal den of venomous snakes. They do this sometimes. Snakes do this. Uh, gather together in big communities like this. Maybe you just get up and get out of there. Just, just, goodness, would you stay if there was venomous snakes all around you? But the interesting thing, though, is that the way that the people moved in this day is they had to wait for God. You might remember that they had a tabernacle that was a portable temple, a tent that was established in the midst of them. And the, the, there was a Shekinah glory, a, a glory cloud that literally shone in light at nighttime and in day it looked like a cloud and it hung right over the Holy of Holies in that temple, that little tabernacle. And every time God wanted the people to move, he would move first. That's how they would know it was time to move out. They'd blast the trumpets, they'd say, oh, God's moving, let's go. They'd stay with God wherever he went throughout their entire wilderness wanderings. So evidently, God parks these people right in a location where he stirs up and drives, he says he does it, drives serpents into their homes, into their midst. They're biting all the people, and God refuses to move. He's parked, not going anywhere. We're, we're going to stay right here. And so people realize they are in big trouble. Venomous snakes. I wonder how many of you are, have a fear of snakes generally. Snakes are significant simply because of the serpents in the garden. Satan himself is called the ancient serpent in Revelation. There's a connection point here that's driven, kind of a thread throughout the whole of the Bible. 
And yet God is the one who has the control over these serpents. He sends them in. And honestly, there are people today who are still quite afraid of snakes. My mom used to say she, she was a tough woman. She is, she is a tough woman. And she, she would never uh, uh, like, uh, admit she was afraid of something. And so I'd catch snakes in the yard sometime and go to bring them inside. And she'd go, nope. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to see it. And I'd go ahead and hold it up in her face and she'd go, get it away from me. I'd say, are you afraid? She goes, no, God put enmity between the snake and the woman. And I was like, okay, fair enough. But I don't know about you, man. Even, even in my house, there's so much as a spider or something that looks like a spider. It's DEFCON 1 in my home. There's not, there have been many times I've been upstairs and heard shrieking screams. I think someone's coming to kidnap my children, okay? And I, you get that. You know, a fight or flight moment, I can sprint down the stairs, and it turns out there's a little ball of lint in the, in the corner of the bathroom. Can you imagine sleeping outside in a tent on the ground with serpents all over, divinely stirred up, looking for a nibble? And so the people do exactly as you'd expect them to do. They realize that something has to change. This is clearly an act of God. They know they're being judged for their rebelliousness. The Israelites are in big trouble, and so what do they do? This is actually, to to their credit, they make the right call. Because look at what it says about them in the next couple of verses, starting in verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Many times in Israel's history, uh, they didn't pick it us up so quick. Why, why did we lose in battle? Why, why Lord, is this happening? They, they, they play that game. But here they know. They're not playing any games. God, we sinned. We rebelled against you and against the man you told to lead us. And so they ask Moses to pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. We can't do it. We need him. They rightly realize they are desperate for God's help. And apart from his intervention, they will die. They will die. So they go to their mediator. They go to Moses. And he does what he does best. He intercedes for the people. He was their intercessor. Repeatedly in this time period, uh, the people are deserving of some kind of wrath. And Moses stands between the people and God and cries out to God on behalf of the people. He establishes a precedent that we need somebody to go between us and God. And and to spoil the end of the story here, Jesus is the perfect, final, ultimate prophet who does just that. Moses himself is not good enough. He's not holy enough. And so God hears Moses' prayers and responds. And this is what Moses uh, retells from God. Verses 8 and 9, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And that's it. That's the, that's the verses. That's the story that Jesus draws upon real quick. And that's what's meant by when Jesus says uh, that uh, as, the, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's what it's talking about. It's not a guy holding a snake. It's Moses, when the people were bitten, when they were dying, when they cried out to God and he prayed to God, God said, make an image of a serpent. Not a real one. You notice that. He didn't go out and go pick up one of the, one of the dead ones you must have stomped on, find a live serpent, put it up there. No, he says, make one. Moses makes it out of bronze, precious metal. He puts it up on a pole, presumably so that many people could see it even from a distance. What happens? Anyone who looks at the serpent lives. That's it. Credits roll on that story. We barely get to hear about that story again. A couple times it references, it just kind of makes a point back. But Here Jesus is drawing upon it. It's a short enough and a simple of enough story. If Jesus didn't reference it in John 3, it may not come to our memory quite as readily as believers, even if we are familiar with the Bible, because it's such a short and simple story. Why does Jesus point to this? 
Jesus compares himself to the bronze serpent. So I'm going to look at John 3 again. Look, look at verses 14 and 15. Let's, let's reread what Jesus said. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man repeatedly in the Gospels. In chapter 9 of this same book, he'll make it explicit. He's, when he's saying Son of Man, he's talking about himself. And so here he is, pointing to that story. Remember, you remember Nicodemus? You remember that story about how Moses had to lift up the serpent? And what happened? People had to look and be saved. Here, he's attaching that to himself. He says, just as that happened, so must I, Jesus says, so must, so must, Jesus, must Jesus, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Lifted up. John uses that term a handful of other places in his gospel uh, record here as he's counting this. Every time that John uses the phrase, it refers to Jesus' crucifixion. Every time. You don't lift up anything else in John. John only uses that phrase to refer to Jesus' crucifixion. This is undeniably the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus' entire conversation with Nicodemus is about salvation. He's not trying to teach him about other interesting doctrines you might find find fun party tricks to bring up with people. No, he cares right out of the gate to explain to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is all about salvation. You must be born again, Nicodemus. What do you mean born again? How, do you, how does an old man climb back into his mother's womb, be born a second time? No, 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 you're getting it wrong. You must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus unpacks it repeatedly and Nicodemus is confused, and here he tells him the story. You remember the serpent? And he tells him that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Eternal life. John will use that phrase, eternal life, 16 times in the book of John, which is it's, it's more than all the rest of the Gospels combined. They don't use that term like he does. Because he's using this as a reference point, talking about heaven, talking about salvation, talking about entering the kingdom of God. That's the connection point that's being made here. In other words, Jesus does not switch gears and go, hey, remember I've talked about being born again? Remember I've talked about how to get into the kingdom of God? Remember I've talked about salvation? Now I want to tell you an interesting old story that has nothing to do with this. Obviously not. We see here Jesus connecting the kingdom of God with eternal life. That's what's meant. You would call it heaven. Call it the new heavens and the new earth. You can call it eternal life. You can call it kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of the beloved son. There's a whole bunch of ways that it can be talked about. Nevertheless, Jesus is making it clear there's only one way to be saved. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In our, in our remaining time, I just want to unpack a little bit the connection point that Jesus is making. We looked at what he said in the text. We look at what was said in that Old Testament text. Now I want to spend the rest of our time just making some observations, asking a couple questions and observing the connection point. Why this story? And what meaning might that have for us? First connection is in regards to the sin of the people. I don't want to miss something so significant. What was the sin? What was the sin of the people? It started with impatience, but their impatience drove them to something worse. The sin was that the people despised the good gifts of God. In their impatience, they, what's the word again? They loathed, they hated what God graciously provided. They hated it. That's strong language being used there. God had provided for them not just one day or two or ten. Forty years they had been given food. And for the record, they, they should have already learned this lesson. Because if you remember, if you've ever read through these stories in the Bible, you'll remember that their grumbling didn't start at 40 years. The grumbling started immediately. And there was even one point in the Israel's history while they're wandering in the desert that they're crying out to God. They're so angry about this manna. They're like, oh, please, we just want meat. Oh, remember Egypt. I'd rather be a slave with meat than out here with God and his manna. Remember what God does? He sends, sends a bunch of quail. He, he, Moses, he speaks to Moses again. Moses tells the people, by tonight, you're all going to be stuffed with meat. They're like, what? 
How in the world can that possibly happen? And flocks of quail, hundreds, thousands, probably millions of birds come into the area, land there on the ground, and they can go out and just pick them up like chickens and eat them. And that's what they do. But God says, these are going to come out of your nostrils. You're going to be so sick of this meat. You're going to be crying out to me for manna again. They should have learned that lesson. Of course God can provide, but stop the grumbling. And they didn't. They didn't learn the lesson. To grumble against God is, by definition, blasphemy. Because it shows contempt for His good gifts. A lack of reverence for God. They dishonored God in this, in their loath, loathing of what He has provided. You know, you need to know today, even as Christians, we can still struggle with this because God still provides manna. He still provides things for us that we get tired of and we want something else. We struggle with discontentment even now in our day. For you, who knows what it could be? You might need to dig into your heart or your mind to understand what it is. It might be a living situation. Maybe you're living in a home or some kind of situation now. You're like, man, this is not ideal. This is too tight. Uh, the roof leaks. Uh, it's too far away from work. Uh, you know, whatever your situation is. And the Lord has provided. You haven't, by your virtue, deserved any roof over your head. And yet the Lord has graciously given that to you. And it's easy for you to just be like, oh my goodness, I'm so sick of this place. Can't wait for something else. The grass is always greener somewhere else. Maybe it's a job. Oh, Lord, to be self-employed. Oh, Lord, to have a different boss. Oh, just to finally be out of this cubicle, be out of this whatever. The Lord has provided. There may have even been a time in your life where you prayed and asked God for a job. He gave you that job, and then later you're, I hate this job. You know what it was for me for, for months? This church building. It took two, almost two and a half years of searching to find and secure a new church building. That was a long time. That was, re- that, was a, that was a hard battle. But one of the heart battles in that, that the Lord had to press upon me and convict me of, is there were times I'd walk in the building and be like, this stupid place. I hate this building. The Lord had to remind me, this is, this is a blessing. This home is a good gift. Don't, don't neglect remember that. Our things that we have, they're gracious gifts from God to be received with gratitude rather than grumbling. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes it's okay for you to acknowledge, you know, this building, it's manna. We do hope for something else. We are looking for something else. We do, we do want to get together in one room in another place and but we can be grateful in the moment. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given. But the people did not do that. We don't do that. Here's a line for you. A faithful people. Faithful people are a contented people. Faithful people are a contented people. We don't whine. We don't grumble. We don't complain against God. We're operating out of our faithfulness. We are grateful. The principle of contentedness is so important. Be content. Be grateful. I heard a I heard a quote here, I wrote down here, from Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. He said this quote regarding contentment. I haven't forgotten. I've heard of some good old woman in a cottage who had nothing but a piece of bread and a little water. Lifting up her hands, she said as a blessing, What? All this and Christ too? That's a great attitude for a faithful people to aspire to. God provides everything we need. He provides everything we need. Rich, what in the world does you being pleased with the provision of a home and work and food, what in the world does that have to do with Jesus and the cross and Easter? Everything. God provides everything and to show contempt for his good is blasphemy. God never provided anything greater than a Savior. And the people loathed him too. When given the opportunity to choose between the perfect sinless Savior or a murderer, literally, the people chose the murderer. Do you remember the scene? Jesus standing there bloodied and beaten, standing before the people, 
who had a few days earlier cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they brought out a murderer, a criminal, an insurrectionist from the prison. And Pilate says, I'll let one of these guys go. Who do you want? Interesting, interesting note. You might remember this, but his name was Barabbas, right? You know what Barabbas means? Bar is son. Abba is father. We have a son of a father standing here and the son of the father standing here. And which did the people choose? They despised Jesus and would rather have a murderer than the author of life. You and I can sometimes overlook the sin in our lives and think, well, is that that big of a deal? Well, I'm complaining a little bit, grumbling a little bit. Is that really worth judgment from God? Is is it really displeasing to Him? Is that 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 big of a deal? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And no, God doesn't always give us exactly what we want when we want it, like tantruming children, because you and I both know that's not good for us. These people have forgotten being in the wilderness with God is better than being in paradise with anything else. What do you think would have happened if God had immediately dropped them into the promised land? What what if that's what it was? They cried out, ah, manna again? Seriously, God? He goes, okay, fine, fine. It's been a while. Promised land. Do you think that would have been good for their hearts? Do you think that would have solved the problem inside of them? Our sin issues run so deep that even when he did give them, us, the greatest possible gift in his son, that gift was not received but was hated. The people despised the good gifts of God. Second observation, the people were dying. They were dying. Their rebellion deserved judgment. God sends the serpents. And just like in the story we just read there, the people were bitten. They they were actually dying. Many had died. Without a cure from God, death. The bronze serpent then was not a preventative measure to keep people from getting bitten. It was for dying people. Let's say, you're, let's say right now, you're to go on a hike and you find yourself, stumble, stumble across a, a rattlesnake. A rattlesnake bites you on the heel. You're miles from home. What do you do? Don't try to suck out the venom. That's a terrible idea. Only in the movies. You know, you know the only hope you can have? Seriously, ch- type, type it in your computer, search on Siri, ask ChatGPT to give you a list of things like I did this week. The only thing you can do is hope for help from somebody else. That's it. That's it. You search, sit still, immobilize yourself, call, call me breathing, uh, raise the, 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 the appendage uh, that, that got hurt. There's a whole bunch of things you can do to try to mitigate that right there. But basically, if you don't find help, you're, you're going to die. What do you think these people would do if they didn't have any venom? They didn't have hospitals. They didn't have a way to take care of that. They were genuinely hopeless. They were dying. That was their condition. Utter and abject hopelessness. The same is true for us as sinners. As sinners, you and I are a dying people. We are dying because of our sin. As a people, in our natural state, And when I say that, I don't only mean the spiritual reality. I'm holding the Bible. I'm talking as a pastor. No, no, no. Yes, spiritually, we are dead in our sins and transgressions. Born into this world already dead, spiritually. We need to be born again, as Jesus said. First birth is not enough. But I mean in a literal sense. We literally die, and you know this. Romans 5.12 tells us that death spread to all men because all sinned. It is proof positive that we are sinners deserving of judgment in need of salvation, in need of a cure. Apart from it, we will die. That's why Jesus uses the language of must. Did you see that? It is necessary the Son of Man must be lifted up. I'll read it again. He says, And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See, they, they must lift up the bronze serpent. Without that, they would all die. They must lift up the Son of Man. Otherwise, they will all die. There's no other hope for salvation. There's no other way around it. All of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus is about salvation and how hopeless he is without God acting. 
Our sin is a real, real problem. Someone must, must die for our sins. Someone, some, someone will die for your sins. You will either die as a result of your own sins, physical and spiritual, or Jesus dies for our sins. That's it. Someone will die. Sin makes us an enemy of God, and we need to be made his friend. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59.2 says that our iniquities have caused a separation between us and our God. We are helpless without the work of the Lord. So first, people despise what God gives us. You know that? There's so much more to be said about that. I'll, I'll resist. The people were dying. They were dying. Today, you and I, we live in a day where people still die because of our sin. Third observation, God provides salvation. It wasn't only God who sent the serpents. It's also God who sends the solution. It doesn't only come from Him that judgment will be there, but also the gracious gift of restored life. God gave Moses a cure. He says, make, make a serpent. Uh, makes, uh, he makes it out of bronze. The Bible doesn't say why he makes it out of bronze. People in history have tried to make a lot out of it. But the crazy thing is, it was a 100% effective cure. Remember back earlier in the days of the COVID pandemic and people were saying, get, you know, get, get, a, get a vaccine and trying to talk about all vaccines and then it'll make it impossible for you. Won't, you can't get infected again or you can't get it so bad that you'll pass COVID to somebody else. And, and it just took a little bit of time before it became really, really evident that no, you can still, even if you get a shot, you can still concoct a disease and die. In other, in other words, simply said, it's not 100% effective. It's just not. No cure is 100% effective for any kind of disease you have. None. But this one was. This one was. 100% effective. Every single soul who looked at the serpent lived. The, the destructive effects of the venom in their body ceased to work like it was never in there. Done. Healed. Finished. New life. God provides that kind of salvation. I suspect that Nicodemus, even if he seems a little foolish here, he doesn't understand some things, we can't, we can't fault him. He's spiritually dead. He's not born again yet. How could he possibly understand some of the stuff Jesus is saying? He even says that. You can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And you're not yet, Nicodemus, so... I suspect he's at least wise enough to know that he needed a cure. I suspect he was wise enough to be like the rest of the Jews in his days, looking for a Messiah, wanting an anointed one, the promised one to come, to give them relief from their enemies and the oppression from the Romans, if, if not any other harm that they could befall. They needed God to provide salvation. We have, all, we have always, always needed God to provide salvation. Always. But the people in Nicodemus' day, they were unprepared for what that salvation would look like. Jesus says it here. He makes himself the snake, the serpent there. Just as that serpent was provided by God to be a 100% effective cure for the venom in the bodies of the people who have been bitten, same is true with Jesus. He is the cure for our sin today, and that's what he's telling Nicodemus. So just a just, uh, biology question here. A simple one. What exactly was it that was killing the people in the Old Testament, in the, that serpent account? It was the venom, right? The venom in, in, in their bodies. The snake bites them. The venom infects their body. They begin to die. A whole bunch of crazy stuff happens when you get bit. Venom was the killer. And yet God has Moses put a snake on a pole, a snake that had no venom in it. It was, not, it was not a snake. It was an image of a snake. And when the people looked at that snake, 
the venom in them no longer had any effect. Now compare that with Jesus. Was Jesus a sinner? No. But Romans 8, 3 says, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Jesus was a real human. Jesus is a real human. Jesus is not a real sinner. There is no sin in him. There's no blemish in him as a lamb, using that illustration from the Bible. There's nothing in him that God would look at and find displeasing. Jesus is perfect and he's holy and he's righteous. There is no sin in him. And yet, what is inside of us that is killing us? Sin. The Bible even says that's the wage of sin. And yet God lifts up his son on a cross who had no sin in him whatsoever. And when people look at his son, the sin in them no longer has any eternal effect. This was in my quiet notes. I wasn't sure if I'd say this or not, but I'll just say it because I think it's incredible. The line right before this, Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I, I did a little bit of that last week and I just explained that what Jesus is saying is he's uniquely from heaven. He knows what God knows and he's uniquely from heaven, unlike anybody else. Why does that connect here? Because this verse begins with and, and as Moses lifted up the serpent. So there's a connection. Here's the connection. The bronze serpent was from the earth and it could only bestow physical life. It didn't provide eternal salvation for anyone. In other words, people who looked at that bronze serpent, did they live forever? No, they died. That only restored to them their first birth life. But Jesus isn't from the earth alone. He's from heaven. He's from eternity. And so when those look upon him, and are saved. It is an eternal salvation. They don't, they don't just get physical life. That's why believers die. Because you still die from your first birth life. You could even die from a snake bite. But not a second death. Jesus is unique. And how do you get the benefits of this salvation? Look. Look at Him. That's it. Look. It really is that simple. Salvation is by faith alone. It's not. Go tell the people to do these things, Moses. He could have, because he has. He'd done that in the past, hadn't he? Tell the people to do these sacrifices. Tell the people to get blood and pass over. Tell them to kill a lamb and then do... They do some things, and that'll be an illustration of some salvation. That is true. God has done that plenty of times. He could do it again. But in this particular story, he didn't. It was simple. Look. Just look. You mean God is not requiring that we do some works or acts in order to work off that bad sin that we had done? No. Look. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. Look on Him for salvation. In other words, someone cries out, the herald of righteousness, the evangelist says, you're, you're dead in your sins. And when you die, you'll be separated from him forever in hell because of your status as enemy of God and your sin. But we found a cure. He's over here. Look, look. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, that's what they're doing. They're looking to him for salvation. They're not looking to anything else for salvation. If you're not a believer here today, that's our gospel, plain and simple. There is no other way you can be saved and you must be saved, friend. Because you are going to die someday. You know it. That is the proof that your sin is that big of a problem for you. But God sends His perfect Son to go to a cross to be lifted up to die a death that only sinners should have to die. That if you believe in Him, if you look to Him for salvation, you will have eternal life. Life. How do I get life if He's dead up there? That's what Easter is all about. Because Jesus' dead, dead body is taken down from that cross, is buried in a tomb, and three days later, he raises again. Literally raises again. I was trying to explain this to my children. We're talking through the Easter story this last week. We had a bunch of little tools. We kind of explained, used to explain, had a little piece of linen cloth, and we're just talking to them about how Jesus was wrapped in linen. Nicodemus wrapped him up. 
Nicodemus prepared his body and stuck him in the tomb. It's hard to imagine what Nicodemus must have thought. But Jesus didn't just materialize out in some spiritual sense that his ghost kind of wandered around and they go, well, his body's in there, but he's alive somewhere. No! He sat up, took off the linen, folded it, set it down, stone rolled, he walked out, and the tomb is empty. That's how that works. How do you know that you can have eternal life? How do you know that you can defeat death in that way? Because the only man who defeated death told you so. Believe on him and be saved. Your sin is your greatest problem. Not somebody else's sin. Don't believe the lies of the world that somebody else's sin, past or present, is your biggest problem. No, your biggest problem is your sin. It's infected you like venom. And the proof is that you're going to die and you know it. You know it. I don't have to convince you of that. But you listen to the man who came back from the dead who said that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's our gospel. Let's pray. Father, we love you and are so grateful for this word. We ask that you would press it deep into our hearts, that we wouldn't forget. We would never neglect for a moment to celebrate the cross, the empty tomb, our risen Savior seated at the right hand of God. Lord, let us be bold in proclaiming it. Let us let this gospel wash over our life and not think that we can earn salvation by any means, but that we must just look upon our Savior who has been lifted up and lived. And I pray for anyone here who, or whoever will hear this who has not done that, Lord, will put their saving faith in you, who will not, will not look to anything else to be saved from death, but look to Christ alone. And join us in celebrating his holy and glorious name for all eternity in the new heaven and the new earth, in eternal life. Grow your choir, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen.